Wednesday, January 3rd. I'm Rim. And I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight we finally get around to talking about an absolutely fantastic anime, Project Blue GQ SOS. Let's, Let's do this. this. So it's anime day and nominally manga and comics day. Woohoo! Took we- long enough to get to this day. Yeah, well, we, only, we didn't even do a Monday show this week. Nope. Nope, nope, nope. Uh, we didn't do a Monday show the week before either. Ah. We're just all about not doing Monday shows. That's fine, because I got a good idea for a Monday show for next week. Oh, really? Yeah, I think we're going to have a pretty good... Uh, we're going to get back on track starting next week with uh, Mondays. I don't know. I think you might be shit-talking. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what it's like uh, Monday night when we're sitting around doing pre-production. We will see what it's like. Yeah, you know, I cut myself with a box cutter today. What? Look. Were you in some sort of box cutter fight? Maybe. Maybe I was. All right. Who won? The box. <laughs> <laughs> in other news, I have conquered the potato guns that Conbad and Ido got for us. Oh, yeah. They gave us, uh, we got potato guns as gifts and potatoes randomly. Yes. And, and um, you know, clown pistols are well and good until you've had a potato gun. Yeah. That doubles as a one-shot water pistol. Yeah, I mean, and I tried to use it, and it didn't work quite intuitively, but I thought it was, oh, it's just a shitty $1 potato gun from the dollar store. No, no, it's metal. It's a really good potato gun that actually shoots potato pretty well. You just have to know how to use it. Yep, the trick is to jam the thing into the potato and then twist it off to the side to get a full spud loadout. Mm -hmm. I still wish you had the kind of potato guns that shot whole potatoes. We could make one in about 45 minutes. We need some PVC pipe. We need some PVC pipe and some ether. That's right. Or possibly some butane if we're wusses. We should make potato light bulbs also. (laughs) (laughs) Right, so... What's wrong with potato light bulbs? I can't think of anything wrong with potato light bulbs. That's right. (laughs) That's right. So, in useless and tossed aside anime news, and I'll mention this only briefly, only because I saw it and I couldn't believe it. Air Gear, one of the worst shows to come out in recent memory that I... You I've... mean that show with the rollerblading? Yeah. Well, the, the roller flying? Yeah, all right, here's the... Take the, the fightingness of Bleach, but remove all the characters and everything interesting about it. Then take Dragon Ball Z and remove everything at all, except for the fighting. And then wait, take, so wait, so you mean Dragon Ball Z in its purest form? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then take Initial D and remove everything but the races. And when I say everything, I mean including the people talking during the races. <laughs> and you get Air Gear, a steaming pile of something horrible. Well, you have to add rollerblades also. They're not even really rollerblades. They're, They're like roller things. You know what they are? They're roller break your neck because that couldn't happen in the real world. It wouldn't right. work. You'd die. <laughs> that is exactly right. All right, not only is this show crap, I don't remember if we reviewed it or if we just said it sucked, but, well... We did a whole show on it saying it sucked. I think we did. It got picked up. It's going to be released in February by ADV. (laughs) Wow, okay, so wait. They could pick up Air Gear, perhaps one of the assest shows ever, but they couldn't pick up, I don't know, um... What show are we watching? Nana. Yeah, Nana. Um, let's see, what else? Hino Tori's not on DVD. Yeah, no, but uh, Air Gear is coming out, so it's all okay. Great. It's <laughs> it's rated MA. I mean, the show is not... I, I figured it first, all right, they're just targeting that you know 9 to 14-year-old crap show demographic, which apparently is very profitable. Mm-hmm. But the show's rated MA, and it's got a lot of uh, nakedity in it. Yeah, I saw it. he li- the dude lives in a house with a bunch of girls and he lusts after that one really awesome girl who's better at roller flying than anyone else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th- th- no, this show is not good news. No, it's not. And despite being not good news, it got picked up. Correct. I could talk more about it, but I, I think it stands on its own. <sighs> if I'm ever a bajillionaire, I'm going to buy all the anime companies and only license the good shows. Yeah. Remember how we were bitching about how the anime industry is secretive? Yep. And then Anime World Order before that was bitching about how the anime industry was secretive? Mm-hmm. Well, uh, they've been bitching again about how the anime industry is secretive. Great. And uh, I'm, I'm going to bitch about it now to continue the cycle because I want to know what rationale they had to pick up this show. Who's going to pay twenty nine ninety eight a DVD for four episodes of poorly animated kid rollerblading? That's a good question. 
Because I don't I, know anyone like that. I really want to know. Is this going to be profitable? I want to know if this show makes money, but there's no way to know. I can't know. There is absolutely no way for me to know if the show is successful or not. Nope. But you know what I do know is that there are companies like Vertical who are publishing high-class stuff like Buddha and Ode to Kirihito that not too many people read, yet somehow they're very profitable. So why cannot ADV do the same thing and publish the high-quality, high-brow stuff that not too many people watch, yet is somehow profitable? Because they probably spent like $14 million on this Air Gear license. You know, this- I think what's happened is, it, this could be true, I'm not sure, is that Maybe Japan has realized. Maybe that we're not they're not as dumb as we think they are cuz we always say oh those Japanese don't understand the American anime industry, right? Yeah. Maybe the Japanese when the fir- in, when people went over there to try to license anime for the first time. Those were super 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 nerdy guys, right? And Japan was probably like the Japanese animation industry was like, "Hey, these American anime industry guys are so dumb. We can rip them off." And they've been ripping us off. For years and years and years and years. But they and also... the American anime industry is just so dumb and so stupid. Though All those anime executives in the U.S. don't know shit. That's why they keep dubbing things poorly and paying too much for licenses from Japan, etc., You know, cetera, I think you've solved it. They were probably sitting around in their secret space. Like, uh... we have faith that someone who's an executive must be a smart person. Someone who's in charge of a big company that makes a lot of money that, you know does all this stuff and is still in business and still profitable must be a smart person. SEO is still in business. Yeah. I think I think uh, it's becoming more apparent that a significant possibility that the people in charge of the anime companies in America are just all complete idiots. Every last <laughs> one of them. And Japan knows it and that's why it sucks for us. See, we get a lot of feedback for the show and I can't wait to hear the feedback from that statement. I can't wait either. That's why I said it. Because we I <laughs> I'm not saying it's true. I'm saying it is a distinct possibility. Because anyone who licenses air gear and thinks it's going to sell I, I couldn't come up with another reasonable conclusion See, other than but that the they're thing a dumbass. Is, what I wonder and I mean, there are shows that are not good that make a lot of money. And I wonder if these shows are profitable. What if Air Gear makes them so much money that they had no choice but not to license it? Then I don't know what to say about American anime fans because, you know, even though... I know what to say about American anime fans. Even though American anime fans, right, tend to kind of like shows like Naruto and Bleach and these kind of crap fighting shows, they tend to also dislike the same... You know, it's like everyone sort of agrees on what the crap is. You don't see Air Gear fans at the cons, you know? And when you start bringing up good stuff, you know, people all tend to agree on a lot of the good stuff. Well, yeah. Even the even the Narutards. When I was hanging out at uh, Animazement, there was a crowd of Narutards. I was trying to quiet them down because they were making a ruckus at like four in the morning in the middle of the con. They we started talking about anime, and they all obviously very much like Naruto, and they all also very much understood that Cowboy Bebop was probably the best animated thing ever made. Mm Hmm. So yeah. Yeah. Speaking of cons. Anime, it's the new year. That was a very nice segue. Yeah, fair. Uh, It's the new year, and AnimeCons.com, which is your number one site for anime con information, has released their year in review of anime cons. It's a pretty good article. You probably want to read the whole article. We're not obviously going to comment on the whole article. No, no, no. They talk about stuff like how, you know, Clamp showed up to Anime Expo and... How Anime Next also made Manga Next, et cetera, et cetera. How Otakon and Katsukon both had Artist Alley controversies. Well, no, they're talking about the Katsu. If they were talking about Katsukon, they're talking about the last Katsukon. They only talk about the Otakon Artist Alley controversy. Well, no, they mentioned Katsukon and the upcoming controversy because they've announced for Katsukon the new rules. Yeah, 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 but they don't talk about the... Well, it's, cause it's, it's mostly about last year. Yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, in this article is a list of the 10 largest anime conventions in North America according to that con's reported attendance. So the thing is, is, you know, depending on how a specific convention counts their attendance. I'm looking at you, Anime Expo. Yeah, we don't actually know how any cons report their attendance. Well, we know how Otakon and Katsuka, a lot of those cons count them, though. Yeah, we're pretty sure we know, but we're not 100% sure. So a lot of the numbers could be off, but... With the best estimates that are available to us, these are the 10 largest anime conventions in North America last year. Number one, I'll start at the top, why not, is Anime Expo with 40,000-something people total 
and 32,000, well, about 33,000 of which actually paid to get in. So about 7,000 people went for free, 8,000 people. Yeah. I mean, that inc- that'll include, like, staff and panelists and De- all that stuff. Dealers, Dealer- the dealers, the artist alleys, the guests. Well, it depends. Some cons charge dealers to get into the con in addition to having yeah, a Yeah, I don't know if they count as paid or not. Mm. I don't know. It's a tough call. These are fuzzy numbers, but considering that I've been to many, well, not many, but I've been to enough of these cons to where I think the numbers are accurate enough. Yep. Anime Expo is still huge. Uh, Otakon... It's estimated that there were about 33,000 total and about 22,000 paid. Wow, about so 10,000 According people. to that estimate, 10,000 people at Otakon getting free, including us. <laughs> yeah, Otakon does seem to be very liberal in its letting people in free. I mean, I've paid for one Otakon in my life. Yeah, I, I don't know. But then again, we've done stuff at every Otakon. I know, so. the question is, it's like... Should Otakon keep letting all these people in free, or uh, are there people getting in free that should be paying? What Otakon, that's, pr- that's a pretty big discrepancy between the total people there and the number of people paying. It's what like, Otakon should do, very simply... It's like a third of the con is there for free. ...is vet out somehow the quality of the panelists so that the people they're letting in free are definitely worth Yeah, the but if there's 10,000 total and 23,000 paid members... The panelists are such a small portion of those 10,000 free... No, nah, because remember, think about bins. how many panels there are, and multiply that by four, and then count all the dealers who pay for a table anyway, so that and doesn't And the dealer's really got to pay like 750 bucks for a table. It's a lot. You know, if you don't make up like $750 in selling shit, it's not a good deal to go to Otakon. As a dealer, anyway. I, I don't know. If I was a dealer, I wouldn't go to Otakon, just for the fact that the competition in the Otakon dealer's room is... Fierce. Yeah, I would go and buy a spot in the dealer's room of Otakon, not to be a standard anime merchandise dealer, but to do some other sort of dealing. Like, you know, if I was another con or, a, you know, just a pimp geek nights <laughs> in we, a higher we've considered profile. considered that. We have very much considered that. It's not worth seven fifty though. Not yet. Not yet. Artist Alley's much cheaper. Okay, next comes Akon. I don't know where that is, but they had 12,500 <laughs> people. I think it's in Texas, right? I'm not quite sure. It's that's surprising that a con that I don't even know where it is is the third biggest. Well, of course, right after that is Anime North with pretty much the same number of people. Yeah. Oh, yep. A, a-, a- cons in Dallas. Yeah, we but, have a decent number of friends who go to Anime North. Yeah, Anime North's in Canada. And, you know, I didn't think that that many people went to it. I thought it was a middling-sized con. No. But apparently it's much larger than I thought. It's like, whoa, maybe we should head out there. Yeah, the only problem is... Is it in is, Montreal, or is it in Toronto? It's, or? It, it's, uh, it's in Ontario, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I go. honestly don't remember, because every year I thought, I'll go to Anime North, and I'd look, and another con would coincide with it directly. It's in Toronto. I don't want to go to Toronto. Me either. Okay. Uh, Anime Central, still big. And the thing is, Anime Central doesn't look like it's grown very much, because I, I don't think it was much smaller than that years and years ago when I used to attend on a regular basis. Well, I, th- I think that cons are pretty much sort of, we're not going to see a lot of con growth anymore. You know, it's, I mean, unless you put, th- there aren't too many places left for cons to be big that there isn't a con already. Yeah, no, in fact, and a lot of cons. there are aren't ro- too many people who would go to cons that aren't already going to cons. Well, n- part of it's that a lot of cons are in places where they get a lot of people and they would continue to grow, but they can't fit more people where they are and there's no suitable venue near enough to where they currently are to keep most of those people around. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that every convention venue for anime cons in North America is already being used. You know, we I think we're nearing like the uh, what's it called? The terminal velocity of uh, con growth. Well, keep in mind, once uh, Beacon builds the con center on the waterfront, we're gonna have to start. We'll see if they actually do that. There aren't any anime conventions in middling downstate New York yet. Yeah, that it would actually it would be a good place, but there's no venue. Well, we gotta wait for that venue to be built. Yep. All right. Next comes Fanime Con, which I've heard the name, and they estimate ten thousand people. That's pretty good too. Yeah. There's a con I didn't hear of. I don't know. Even, I'm not even gonna click to find out where it is. Uh, Anime Weekend Atlanta. That's we- Anime World Order's favorite con. Had about nine thousand people. All right. So it's a half an Otakon. It's not so bad. Yeah. Next, Anime Boston is another one that I've always wanted to go to, but it always either conflicts with another con. Or conflicts with another con. Yeah. I don't know. Anime Boston, you know, it seems like a big con. It's, it seems like it's worth going to. But 
it always conflicts with something. They, I don't know what the timing of it is, but it's pretty bad. They should try to move it. I think they would probably get more. They'd probably be able to get over that 10,000, maybe like 15,000. Sakura Khan, they said 8,300 total, 7,500 estimated paid. Doesn't Sakura Khan in Seattle? I think It's out in Washington. Yeah, I think that's competing with the PAX. Yeah. <laughs> that's basically competing with PAX, sort of, for the... Uh, North Pacific Coast uh, convention crowd. Yeah, anyway, last and certainly not least, the con that we will be talking about a lot in weeks to come because we are going to be doing awesome things at it, KatsuCon. Yep, we're going to KatsuCon, the 10th biggest con, apparently. 6,400 people estimated, about 6,000 paid, all right. Eh, that's where we're going to be in when? Like a month? Uh, the weekend around February 18th. I think 18th is the Sunday when we'll be driving back home. Okay, so that weekend, KatsuCon, we're going to be there doing more than we have ever done at any convention ever. Yeah, <laughs> except possibly CitiCon. Yeah, I think KatsuCon's problem is they say KatsuCon, in the article, it says how KatsuCon used to be keeping pace with Otakon because it is in a relatively similar geographic location. I think the problem, the reason KatsuCon hasn't been growing is because the hotel and transportation situation in D.C. is pretty difficult, whereas in at least in Baltimore... There's a bunch of hotels all around the convention center. Well, there. I mean, I've gone to several Katsukans, and there are, I think, a lot of reasons why Katsukan is not growing that much anymore and why, in fact, it seems to be kind of stagnant. Not that it isn't a good con, but, yeah, D.C. really just kind of sucks to travel to. I mean, it's difficult to fly there and get to the con. The hotel fills up, and you got to get shoved into some overflow hotel somewhere. The metro is not terribly useful. The hotels are so expensive that it costs me... A lot more money to go to Katsukan than it does to go to Otakon. Ooh. Yeah. Quite a bit more. Mm. Yeah. And also, uh, the vibe of Katsukan is very different from other cons. The crowd tends to be older. Tends to be a lot more people our age there. There's a lot more drinking. A lot more older people walking around talking quietly about anime. And there's really not so much of a young kid, family-friendly presence that a lot of other cons seem to exude. Mm. They also talk about the lack of growth of Otakon. Like compared, I mean, Otakon did grow, but compared, usually Otakon grows tremendously. And this year, they only grew by a little bit and didn't reach their cap. And they have a separate article about why that is and such. And I'm really starting to think that one big barrier to a lot of cons growing any further is the fact that hotel and transportation situations are kind of difficult. Yeah, and I mean, people look, are tired of dealing with it. Otakon last year. Every hotel in the city was sold out like months and months and months before the con. And I bet there's a lot of people who probably wanted to go to Otakon but couldn't get a hotel and just gave up. And there's a lot of people who would go to Otakon because it's a fun time. They're not saying it's not a fun time or that they don't want to go, but it's just not worth, even if they get a hotel room, it's just such a hassle to do it and get there and transport that it's not worth it. Of course, those people should listen to our three-part series on how to attend anime cons to learn that that's not true. You can go to cons very easily if you plan a little bit. Yeah, but, you know, there's not enough smart people to... <laughs> to you don't make... need to be smart. You just need to listen to Geek Nights. That that would be smart, though. <laughs> okay. Things of the day! Hot damn. So you know all those videos, that, like the stop motion things you see, where people will jump, take a picture, jump, take a picture... And then eventually, you know, it looks like they're flying around on their knees. There's been a lot of them on YouTube lately. Or the ones where, uh, you know, they take a picture of him standing, then standing a little bit to the right, and then he slides around. Well, this is nothing new. Like, I thought it was something new when I saw it, you know, about a couple of years ago on the Internet. You know, with the famous... <laughs> yeah. Well, apparently, some guys in 1952, or 53, beat him to it. If I may. Yes. It was uh, some Canadian, that, like the National Canadian Film, whatever it's called, <laughs> made a video in 1952, in well, now I guess not a video, a film in 1952 in color with a story of the, these two guys who are neighbors and they fight over this flower that grew, you know, right between their properties and such, you know, and it's got this message of love thy neighbor and whatnot, but... The point of it is, it, it does the cool stop motion stuff that everyone has been doing recently on YouTube that they seem to think is so awesome. You know, these they do the whole jumping up and down thing, and 
they do some other stuff, too, that's a lot more creative and interesting than what anyone else has done. At least what anyone else has done recently that I've seen. This is definitely worth watching. Yeah, plus it was 1952, people. You are not original nor creative. <laughs> well, by that logic, I mean... <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Right. So, over the weekend, the party, uh, one of our dear friends, Lisa, showed us a video that her brother had done. And this video is now currently on YouTube. And normally we wouldn't have such an incestuous linking for a thing of the day. But this is pretty damn funny. Yeah, usually, you know, some kid makes a video for a school project or whatever. And sometimes they're okay, and sometimes they're kind of lame. But this is actually uh, pretty good. I mean, it's about lucid dreaming and coca puffs. <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't really want to ruin it. But suffice to say, the operative point here is that uh, whenever someone is killed in this dream, or whenever there's blood, instead of actual blood or gore appearing, it is replaced by Cocoa Puffs, which can be eaten to induce a state not unlike the quickening from Highlander. <laughs> awesome. And uh, I don't know what I just watched this video. It's like 10 minutes long, and I guarantee it's worth laughing at. Yeah, I mean, I laughed a few times. I thought it was going to be lame or whatever, and it wasn't really lame. I remember one time when you didn't kill your friends and eat their Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, we're going to talk about something that I can't believe we haven't talked about yet. Well, I think we were going to talk about it, and then we held off for a week, and what happened was we just never ended up actually making a show about it. Yeah, because I thought back, and I could practically remember talking about it, but no, we never we did. We might have mentioned it in passing, but we clearly did not have an episode on it where we talked about it in enough detail. Yeah, this we is did, something... We talked about it on the forums, though, so people on the forums, uh, you probably know about this already. Yeah, this is something special, and I really think that everyone out there who is in any way, shape, or form a fan of anime or science fiction will want to see this. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, first off, there was this guy named Shigeru Komatsuzaki. Now, he's sort of an important guy. Basically, way, he's, he's back in the day, like the 40s, he was a famous Japanese science fiction illustrator and model designer. Now, he has worked on such uh, notables as Thunderbirds, Atragon. Yeah, he, he did a lot of shit. Basically, Atragon was this boat with a big drill on the front that could fly and shoot and it was sort of crazy and it was his famous science fiction novel i don't know if he wrote the novel but he definitely illustrated the atragon and designed the ship and all that sort of stuff and that novel had a lot of things based on it a lot there was a live action movies atragon which because of marketing reasons were merged with the kaiju universe of godzilla and now think about that. In America, when they want to market something, they always add like a product that they can sell. Like uh, when Home Alone 2 came out, they added that talk boy thing. They always have some sort of product tie-in for marketing or like a little kid or an Yeah, so rather CG than thing. take the great sci-fi story of Atragon and just make a live-action movie, they made a kaiju movie. What does that say about Japan when if you want to alter something for marketing, you add kaiju to it? Yep. Anyway, that's what they did. And there's an anime Atragon, which is a two-part OAV, called Super Atragon. We watched this after Otakon a couple years ago, I think. Because Scott Johnson bought it for cheap in the dealer's room. Uh, Scott Johnson bought a DVD for cheap. Gee, when does that happen? <laughs> I don't know. What, wait, wait. Has he, has he not bought a DVD for cheap in the last five seconds? That might be a record. We have it on good authority that the source material for Super Atragon is very, very good. Yeah, apparently this the original novel of Atragon is awesome. Really awesome. But I can't find it in English or I'd buy it and read it. Now, the anime, the, the anime, OAV, oh, kinda, The two-part OAV of Super Atragon. not so great. Not, not good, no. No. It starts out, actually, it starts out really, really good. It has so much potential. It looks like it's going to be so cool. And, I mean, it starts out with, like, nuclear bomb going off, like Hiroshima time, and then crazy stuff happening, and aliens in the sea, and submarines. But I guess the OAV cut all everything that was good out in order to make the adaptation from the novel. And mm-hmm. what we had left was mediocre animation and a long, meandering plot that doesn't really go anywhere. But you can tell when you're watching Super Atragon that whatever this was based on, wherever they got... The ideas for this particular, you know, it's the way they tell the story in Super Atragon that sucks. But you can tell that the original story that they are telling you 
was good before they told it. Yes. It's like some guy trying to tell you about something awesome that happened, but he doesn't know how to speak. That's what Super Atragon is. Anyway, way back in the day, this guy made some uh, illustrations called Earth SOS. And they were pretty cool illustrations. I'd like to see them. Just now, well, not just now, but uh, when, in July, I think. Yeah, in July of 2006 through December 3rd, 2006, some people, well, because uh, Komatsuzaki died, I think, in late 2001, early 2002. Yeah, not too he long was, ago. He was 85, though, so, I mean, come on, you know, get the guy credit. Um, they decided to make a six-part OAV based on the Earth SOS illustrations. This is called, predictably enough, Project Blue Earth. SOS. Or in Japan, Project Blue Chikyu. SOS. If you can't figure out what the word Chikyu means, I suggest you stop listening to our show. <laughs> All right. Project Blue Earth SOS is kind of difficult for us in the uh, English speaking world to see because, well, only one episode has been translated and put on the internet, as far as I can tell. Yeah, and a few of our friends we haven't tried, but other people have looked around for Raws. And not really found much of anything outside of the first episode. Yeah, it's a six-part OAV. It was on TV. I don't know, but, you know, they put them all on TV one at a time. And I think it's done now. But uh, it, it, it's got to be on DVD at some point. And when that happens, we'll eventually see it. I guarantee this is going to come over to America in some way, shape, or form. If nothing else, it'll get released on DVD in Japan. And then the fan servers will make quick work of it. Yep. Now, we can't talk a lot about what goes on in the show, because in the first episode, it's basically a lot of build-up, a lot of setting, everything, all the puzzle pieces Character are kind introductions. of set up, you're introduced to all the characters, and then at the end of this first episode, all hell breaks loose, and then the show begins in earnest, and that is right when the closing credits start. Yep. It's freaking awesome. Holy shit. Um, I, the basic premise here is that, now, well, first off, the style. The style is really cool. It's kind of a mix between futurism and past futurism. Yeah, take Read or Die plus Encyclopedia Brown plus Atragon. <laughs> and you get this show. And you get this show. It's you know, If you've watched Read or Die, not the TV series, the original OAV. And, yeah, you know, the TV series can die in a fire. Yeah, you like that kind of style where... You know, there's people doing all kinds of high action stuff with fancy gadgets and technologies, but there's also this sort of old style at the same time. That's what Atrig uh, that's not what Atrigon <laughs> is. That's what Project Blue Earth SOS is. I mean, the setting, the way it's set up, it's kind of like the future as it was probably imagined by people in the 50s. So well, I think it's based on a guy's illustrations from the 40s. So he was drawing what he thought the future would look like, which means he was including the technology from his time. You know, it's it's what this guy thought the future would look like. And not well, of what course, we the way the anime is done, I th there's a lot of aesthetic liberty taken. And it definitely they're going for the retro future look. I mean, p part of the opening is that there's this new maglev train using a special G-reactive engine. It's like the future of transportation and energy. Mm -hmm. It's a maglev train. Maglev. Future, future maglev awesome. All the reporters lined up uh, documenting this are using old-style cameras with flash bulbs, like old flash bulbs where the guy holds up the stick and it goes poof. And they, they're recording onto reel-to-reel -reel film, not digital recorders. Or anything like that. And then it like it shows a shot of the city, and there all, there's all these elevated trains going around. But the elevated trains have propellers on the front pulling them. Yeah. Hey, this guy's at one point, they sit down to watch a movie to, to learn. Oh, that's the best part and of the, the whole... The butler pushes a button, and down from the ceiling, this automatic lowering thing pulls down a reel-to-reel -reel video projector. <laughs> With the film already loaded, and then you get this grainy, flickering thing that they all watch. Meanwhile, they have hover cars. <laughs> hover cars that look like 1950s cars. Yeah, hover cars, but the controls are like 1950s buttons. I think the other, one of my other favorite parts is when there's a car chase, a really well done and quite interesting car chase, where the hover car at one point, she, the person driving it needs to turn around and spin and do something cool. 
and proceeds to work the clutch and shift gears. And I really wonder what the hell she was doing shifting gears <laughs> on a thing that has no possible... <laughs> I can't imagine what that did. I don't know either. But it, it's, you know, it seems silly. But when you actually watch it, you don't really know. It doesn't stick out like a sore thumb. It's just this really awesome read or die kind of style that's very uh, awesome. Especially if you're an anime fan. If you're an anime fan, you'll just watch this and go, holy shit, it's all awesome. Holy crap. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Even if you're not an anime fan. I mean, this is the kind of, I remember way, way back, I showed my dad a uh, read or die. And he thought it was pretty badass. Even though, you know, it's kind of weird. And you really wouldn't think that, I guess, non-anime fans would like that sort of thing. But there's a certain level of that kind of aesthetic beyond which even normal people will love this stuff. Well, I think it's it just... It just feels really fun to watch all this stuff because you have the like the bright colors and you have some sort of familiarity with this old technology, while at the same time you go ooh and ah at this fancy future sci-fi shit. I mean, while they're doing, you know, there's the reporters with their flashbulbs and this maglev train, and then one of the main characters, uh, Billy Kimera, Kimera, comes down out of the sky on this crappy jetpack. <laughs> yep. Uh Good times. So the actual plot is that scientists in 1995 have developed this G-reactive engine, which they're not really very detailed on what this G-reactive engine is at all. And it, it probably doesn't requires matter. people as fuel or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> uh, I get the impression that it's more just very high technology, like something beyond what humans would normally be capable of. Yep. But they've got this thing. And they test it out on a fighter jet, which is where you test out all new engines. Now, we're going to spoil the first five minutes, because this is... We can't. We don't want to spoil the awesomeness that happens later, but we have to spoil something, or there's really nothing we can say. Yeah. So they're testing this awesome reactive engine, and this jet takes off, and it goes crazy, crazy fast. It's a total success. Like Mach 13, 14, 15, 21, 22, 23. Stupid fast. So the test is a success. Before the test pilot can come back... This weird rainbow glow appears, and before anyone knows it, the ship and all the stuff disappeared. Yep. So the reactive engine... And right before the guy disappeared, he was like, UFO, oh God. So now this reactive engine has disappeared, and everything associated with it. And the research scientists are uh, sitting there going, um, ah, fuck. So then, fast forward... They're, they've got this maglev train. The G-reactive engine, they know it's a success. Yeah, the show takes place like five years after that. And they're about to debut the first maglev G-reactive train. And obviously something happens at this point or else there wouldn't be a show. Mm -hmm. Not really going to ruin any more than that other than that a dog climbs up a ladder faster than a human could. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was a good part when the dog went up the ladder. I mean, the characters are all young and awesome. Lot of breast. Yeah, the, the, there is a character named Doctor Breast, and he has a daughter who is like eight, and her name is Lotta Breast. L O T T A space B R E S T. Now I know that the Japanese people are overall a very intelligent people, and there is no doubt in my mind that that was fully intentional. There, it has to be intentional. There is no way that that can well, happen the by accident. The little girl's name is Lotta Breast. Her older sister? It's not her sister. It's like this girl who like hangs out with her. Whatever. Sort of like her nanny or something. Whatever. The the woman who she is often with is could be described as smoking. Yeah. Oh, I mean, for an anime character, sure. Well, yeah. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer two-dimensional women. Uh, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, but we've also got Penny Carter, who is kind of this vagabond smart kid. Who has his dog, Washington. Washington being the best character in the yeah, show. Yeah, basically, Penny Carter is this sort of poor... Well, he's not poor, but he's an MIT graduate. And he's sort of like the lone hacker with a dog, right? And he's real smart, and he gets shit done. Meanwhile, you also have Billy Kimura, who is like a mega zillionaire kid. So you, and he's also really smart. So you've got like two Encyclopedia Browns with the same goals, competing to see who does it first. And one of them's like... Just some poor smart kid, and one of them's a rich smart kid. Now add to that, effectively Penny from Inspector Gadget. Yep. And a bunch of other super badass people. I can't say anything more about that. Hey, you know, that is kind of, it's like Penny Carter, 
And also, he has a dog. He's like the male Penny from Inspector Gadget. Yeah, except everyone's badass. There's no non-badass. Um, what's his name? Is is not so much badass. I don't know how much Captain of a, Clayton. I don't know how much of a character he's gonna be long term. I don't know how much either. But Captain Clayton is sort of not a badass. Oh, you know who else isn't a badass? He, mm-hmm. Those two guys who get axed. Who got axed? Those guys who get shot by that thing. Halfway through the show. Oh, okay, yeah. Those guys were not so badass. But they weren't real characters, though. They didn't have names. No. No. Anyone with a name is at least kind of badass. I mean, Captain Clayton is at least smart. <laughs> a little bit. But everyone else is just super awesome. Like, yeah. hoo-ha! And they're super awesome in the reader die way. This is the kind of show where if you show it to a crowd of people, there will be regular and periodic yelling, shouting, screaming, and cheering. Mm-hmm. You know, guys will get trapped, and the army guy's yelling at him, and then the army guy gets distracted for a second. He cuts back, the two chairs are empty, the crowd goes nuts. Yeah, and you know, now that I realize that this came from Atragon, I see a lot of similarities. You know, the there's the UFOs kind of thing, but no one really knows about it. And, you know, there's the big ships of mystery, and it, there's, there's a lot of similarities. There's a lot of mystery that's probably going to be revealed as the show goes on. Mm-hmm. I mean, they really lay it on pretty thick, too, with that green-haired girl. Oh, man, that they lay it on heavy. It's like, ooh, here's a green-haired girl. She appears mysteriously before two characters. Oh, oh, don't forget, she says something cryptic. She says something cryptic and then disappears. Ooh. <laughs> now, one thing to be said about this show is that each episode is 45 minutes long, so it goes longer than what you'd expect from a but typical... But there's only six episodes, so it's kind of like getting six mini movies because the first episode in itself i watched it you could have told me that that was an anime movie or something like that and i would have believed you totally well plus it, it, it it'll play out like a 13 episode show probably in terms of the amount of plot in it because while it's 45 minutes that is an action-packed 45 minutes they don't you will never get bored watching this mm-hmm. uh it's so sad because you know uh, when it comes to new anime there is not a great quantity of it Well, I mean, what are we watching right now? We're watching Nana. Yep. There's Death Note, but we read the manga already. Yeah, I'm going to watch like five key episodes from Death Note, and that's it. But we'll see how much time I have to watch it. Uh, The Kemo Nozume whatever is kind of okay, but we have to see where that goes, and we have to wait for it to come out or whatever. Yeah, pretty much the previous set of TV shows we haven't watched yet, so we're not even looking at what's coming out now. Yeah. There's nothing coming out now. We have to wait for a new season again. It'll be a few months, and then there'll be more anime. Yeah, maybe we'll catch up. Maybe we will catch up. Maybe not. Who knows? Of course, catch up. We're also currently watching <laughs> uh, Standalone Complex Second Gig, finally. Yep. But, I mean, of all the newer anime, you know, this came out in 2006. This is the thing to be most excited about. It's probably the best anime of the past year or two, hands down. I'm real excited about this. I mean, pretty much, Nana is probably my favorite show right now. Yeah, it's now, like but... I watch Nana, you know, and I like it. And it's good, but I'm not excited about it. I'm not like, oh, Nana, I can't wait for more. This is like, I need to have this now. Where is it? What the fuck? I want to buy a DVD. Here is $50. Where is it? You're dumb. Why did you not give it to me? Yeah. Uh, I guess what I could say, just for mostly for the benefit of people who might be listening, I don't know, months or years from now from the archives, if you see Project Blue Earth SOS in DVD form, no matter what it costs, there is no reason not to buy it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's a Japanese, if you speak Japanese, you should just buy the the Region 2 DVD. Yeah, right now. If you can play it. There's there's really no reason not to. I mean, there's the only hesitation I have is that we've only seen the first 45-minute episode. You're worried it might gonzo? Well, it does take a strong turn at the end of the first episode, and I imagine that turn leads into the plot of the remaining five episodes. So... It could be that after it takes that turn, the show is not as good. I highly doubt it. Yeah, because I mean... It would be so hard to screw it up. Because Chevalier kind of did that. Of course, I only saw two episodes, but Chevalier, the first episode, I was so pumped about this show that it had everything cool in the world in it. And then the second episode was like a rock falling into a well. Oh, that sucks. That sucks real bad. I didn't think it... it, it Chevalier was that bad, but it definitely... No, well, it's fallen into a well. It didn't hit the bottom yet. Yeah. yeah. For all I know, it might recover. It might just be one bad episode. They might have just made the second episode accidentally crappy. That is possible. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know. Anyway, Project Blue GQ SOS is the awesome anime. You need to see it. 
There, you know, I noticed that pretty much like the science fiction anime tends to be the awesome, and also the animes that are based on novels as opposed to manga tend to be pretty strong. Also, maybe that's just because novels in Japan are more serious, and we like more serious anime. You know, and manga tends to be not always as serious. Well, there's a lot of serious manga. There is that, serious that, manga, that but there isn't. doesn't get released in the U.S. And it doesn't get turned into anime as often. God, every time I go to a Kinokuniya, there's that wall of manga for me. It's nothing but Yakuza and politicians and more Yakuza. Yep. And it's all in Japanese and no one translates it. Yep. Uh, and and I, no one makes anime out of it. And I, I would, I'd love to just learn Japanese to read it all. But I flipped through a couple of them, and there's more kanji than I could ever learn in the rest of my life. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm having enough trouble with basic grammar here. Yeah. Well, here's an awesome, awesome science fiction anime. Appeals to all ages. Kicks ass. It's a lot of fun, a lot of colors. High quality, brand new. And, of course, uh, in closing, take that, Daryl Surratt. Where were you reviewing this show? Uh, they, they probably either didn't know about it, which I doubt, or they didn't see enough of it to talk about it. But they didn't even mention it at all, so whatever. Maybe they haven't seen it. Who knows? I don't know. I don't know. We should have done this show a long time ago. We just, I don't know why we, uh, we, it's like we, we saw it, we mentioned it on the forums because it was so good, and then we just never did an episode. I guess I just assumed that we'd done an episode. I also did, but I just searched our website for the word project, and I don't see anything. That uh, includes this ep- this show. But think about what that says. This show was so badass that we imagined that we had done a show about it, when in fact we had not. I guess it's because we just talked it up so much outside of the show. We basically did four or five shows about it to all of our friends. Yeah, and we talked about it in the forums a lot also. Yes, we did. All right, I think it's time to go to bed. We need some sleep. Yeah, we've been a little tired uh, tonight and last night due to the fact that we haven't slept pretty much at all since, I don't know, Last Friday. Yeah. We're going to do a show tomorrow, and then next week we will resume doing awesome non-tired shows. Yeah, we got a good bit lined up, too, so be prepared. Uh Uh-oh. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music. Be sure to visit our website at www.frontroadcrew.com where you'll find show notes, links, our awesome forum, a link to our Frapper map, and links to all the RSS feeds. We say feeds plural because Geek Nights airs four nights a week covering four different brands of geekery. Mondays are science and technology. Tuesdays we have video games, board games, and RPGs. Wednesdays are anime, manga, comic nights. And Thursdays are the catch-alls for various rants and tomfoolery. You can send us feedback by email to geeknights at frontrowcrew.com. Or you can send audio feedback via Odeo. Just click the link that says send me an Odeo on the right side of our website. If you like what you hear, you can catch the last 100 episodes in iTunes or in your favorite podcatcher. For the complete archives, visit the website, which has everything. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 2.5 license. This means you can do whatever you want with it, as long as you give us credit, don't make money, and share it in kind. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.